And thank you, Pastor Shirley. And even as I come forward, I just want to bring greetings in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings to each and every one of you who are here on site with us, as well as greetings to those who are watching and joining us online. You know, today is a day that the Lord has made. And truly, we want to be, as a people of God, be able to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It was not too long ago, just last week. We had crossed a very important event. It's a time that the people of God came together to celebrate Pentecost. And we understand that certain events took place. And that event began to transform people, began to transform a society, and it began to transform nations. So this morning, as I turn to the Word of God, let's quieten our hearts. Father, we just give you all glory. We give you all thanks, we give you all praise. It's you who have called us out of darkness. Is you have called us into your marvelous light. So we come, Lord. We come. We come, God, not just trusting in our own goodness, not trusting in our own righteousness. But God, we thank you for the gift of new life. We thank you, God, for your word. Your word that would reach us out of darkness. As a living word, as word has drawn us into your bosom. As a word that gave us the Holy Spirit. Father, even as I turn to your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, Lord, be acceptable in your sight. And I thank you, Spirit of the living God, that you would just sweep over each and every one of us. That you lift off every, every spirit of tightness, every distraction, that truly you begin to open the eyes and the ears of our understanding that we can see and hear what you're trying to say to us, your body today. And we give you all glory, we give you all thanks, we give you all praise in Jesus' precious name. And the people of God will say amen and amen. Acts chapter 2 tells us that when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Hear this word, fully come. It was a time of expectation. It was a time that was supposed to be coming. But on that day, the word of God says it was fully come. And the people of God, where were they? They were gathered all with one accord in one place. In one accord, in one place. And then the word of God says, suddenly, it was like instantly. It like immediately. It was with a word that a sense of urgency was put in. And there came a sound from heaven. There was a declaration. There was a proclamation. There was something that heaven was trying to come. It's a time where heaven was starting to invade earth again. And then that sound as of a rushing mighty wind. I can just imagine rushing, mighty, loud. And it filled all the house where they were in one accord, where they were in that one place. And there appeared unto them, the word of Scripture says, cloven tongues as a fire. And it set upon each and every one of them. And the word of God says they were all. Hear the words, all. All means each and every one that was in the room was filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues. Not as they chose but as the Spirit gave utterance. And we understand that there was what? 
a tangible. There was something that was real. The spiritual had become a manifestation in the natural. And certain things after that took place. But one thing I just want to stress again and again. They were what? They were in one accord, united in thinking, united in mind, united in heart. That's what oneness brings. And the court was about an agreement. And one place, there's a unity in gathering. There's a strength in gathering. There's a reason for gathering. It was about a one community, a one community of united people in mind, in thought, in heart. One united community of people that was going to expand and explode. And with that heavenly manifestation, as the Holy Spirit came, something loud, tangible, a spiritual invasion, and people were amazed. They were amazed. The Shekinah glory of God had burst out in a different form. But others, and every time there's a move of God, how many know there will be skeptics? There will be people who are very skeptical of things of God. And some derided what was happening and began to say, ha, they are drunk. And we see how Peter then stood up. How many know that as people of God, we are called to be ready to stand up in the face of opposition, in the face of resistance, in the face of skepticism, in the face of ridicule. And as Peter stood up, he began to preach a message, a message that reached out, a message that pricked, a message that touched, a message that began to solicit a response. And we see here, he began to affirm one thing, he began to affirm that scripture was taking place. That the prophecy of Joel was being fulfilled. He explained how their sins had crucified Jesus Christ and why Jesus Christ had to be crucified. But more, his message brought a call, a call to repentance. A call to be baptized in faith. A call for remission of sins to happen. A call to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here, Scripture continues to tell us that the people were touched. The people not only gladly received the word, but they were baptized. And on that day, 3,000 souls were saved. What was the result? A community, a visible and large community of people with 3,000 added was birthed out. And Acts chapter 2 continues to tell us this community has some uniqueness a uniqueness that began to make a difference. First, the Bible says in verse 42, they continue steadfast. Steadfast. I don't even hear the word. Steadfast means what? Hungry, willing, desirous. Desirous of what? First, the apostles' doctrine. There was and arose a hunger for the Word of God. How many know every time that God wants to make a new move, the Word has to go forth? And as the Word of God reminds us, and the Word would not return to God void. But the Word has gone forth more than what the prophets have said. It has gone forth more than just what was spoken. It has gone forth as a living Word. A living Word where 
we who believe can see, can hear, can read, can understand. There was a hunger for the word. Next, there was a desire for fellowship, for coming together, for engaging together. And there was a participation of communion as they broke bread together. And there was communication. Communication as they got together to pray. And Acts chapter 2 again, verse 43, that tells us that there was a fear. Now this is not a negative, not a perverse fear. But there was a sense of awe. There was a sense of reverence. There was a sense of deep respect. Yes. And the result, now I want you to hear this, and I will speak a bit about it later on. And the result was not a community that was, wow, really moving in signs and wonders. Not yet. But as they came together, in that fear of God, fear came also to everyone that was around them to observe. And, I know the word and, and what was and? There was wonders. There were signs that were being performed by the apostles. Note that. Not every newly enlisted member of the community, not every member of the community was moving yet in the miracles and signs. But because of that coming together, because of that all, there were selected people in the midst that were able to move in that wonders and signs. Then Acts 44, verse 44 and 45 of Acts 2 shows us that they all believe together. I like the word again. They all believed together. And not just believed, they began to act out what they believe. They had all things in common. They decided to come together to share things. And what did they do? They sold their possessions, the goods, and they then parted. They then gave it to the people that's in their midst who had the need. You see, a transforming faith began to happen as the Holy Spirit came, not only of people who believed, but there was transforming faith that took action. And people began to what? To begin to share the things that they had. Share things as a community. There was really faith in action. And this is the crux and importance of it. Faith is not just about believing. Faith is not just about trusting. Faith is about action that will come because of what you believe and what you trust in. And this is critical. And we must always understand this. It's good to believe. It's good to trust. But does your faith and your trust and what you believe governs and governize you to action. Here, they not only sold, they gave. And Acts chapter 2, verse 46, further shows us another important revelation of this body as they came together. As they came together, the body of Christ began to tell us something else began to be visible. Something else showed beyond their faith in action. They continued daily with one accord in one place in what was the temple then, in what we've been called the church today. And what did they do? Not only came together in the one accord, but they continued breaking bread, going from home to home, and as they did so, they did partake in eating 
And, and this is a conjunctive word, and they did so with gladness and with singleness of one heart. Now I like this word. So they were in one place. But then that one place then went out and they went from home to home. They fellowship. They had a meal together. And that's important. There was gladness. Singleness of one heart. Wow. And as I look at this, believers gathered in unity. Believers in visitation. Believers in one attitude of gladness and singleness of heart. And we begin to see a certain revelation in verse 47. They begin to praise God together. And as they were praising God, they had favor. This is the word that Scripture has been referring to for a long time. That people of God may find favor not only with men and every woman in need, but from favor with God. It shall flow. And as a result of this, favor with people around them, the word of God says. And what happened? And God added to the church daily such as should be saved. Believers praising God. Believers finding favor. Believers having numbers added and the community grew even more. You know, as I began to reflect, as I began to ask, you know, I have been in church community from the day that I was born, so to speak. I was born in the Christian family. And I've been brought up in the institution called a church. You know, one day I woke up to ask myself the question, what was the difference in that community at the time of the first Pentecost? And what has it become even right now? As I reflect, we see this. People believed, repented, were baptized. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. A body of transformed believers were formed and impacted the society around them. And we see numbers added as a group. The question I had to ask myself was this. What really happened at Pentecost 2,000 years ago? What is it that God was trying to reveal? And what is the relevancy of it to us today? I began to ask, was it about the birth of the New Testament church? Or was it about the transformation of believers, individual believers, you and I, and believers coming together collectively as a body of Christ? To answer these questions, perhaps we must first understand that a Pentecost 2,000 years ago was about a prophetic fulfillment. It was about God showing something that had been hidden right from the foundations of earth and something that we have perhaps not understood and lost. That hidden reality was that God always wanted a habitation with his people and to build a kingdom of priests and of kings that would have dominion over the whole of his creation. Wow. That began to sink into me first. I thought it was all about salvation. But no. It's not about us alone. It's about what he wants. And as I began to reflect even more of this, I began to understand what God was really doing. You see, God's intention 
for the habitation, for a kingdom of kings and priests, for his creation, man to have dominion. It was lost. It was lost because of sin. Because of sin, they came as a result of disobedience. And because of sin, man is now separated from God. The habitation that God always intended and wanted could not happen. The reality was this, and this is the most important thing we need to understand besides the first focus that God always wanted a habitation was two, that somebody had to restore or renew the habitation. God did not wait for you and for I. God already had someone prepared to be sent. And Jesus had to come to lay aside his divinity, to assume frail humanity in order that he would prepare or restore or renew that possibility of habitation for God again. And in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said these words. Perhaps his disciples did not and could not fully understand. And even today, we also fail to understand. In his very words, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But I go. Now listen to this word. I go. And it's important you remember these words because it will tie down with scriptures about his going. And I go to prepare a place for you. And I go, I go. Put it in. But I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What is he saying? Today I've heard so many speeches of people preaching about God has mentioned for you in heaven. You got big houses, you got poor houses. Depending on how much work you do, is that's where your reward is. But have you ever thought your reward is a promise to have a glorified body like Christ? Your reward is to be a place of constant fellowship with God. Your reward is not about a house. Because with a glorified body, you don't need a house. What is this mansion? What is this mansion that had prepared by Jesus going through the crucifixion? By his resurrection and his ascension? Well... Is it a habitation, physical habitation in heaven? But heaven is a place that is spiritual. Is it really a habitation here on earth? Are we to worry about building huge houses, palaces for ourselves? Or is he speaking something that's more spiritual, that's more vital, that's more important? You see, the key first, if Jesus did not die, we are still sinners. <clears throat> and the Bible says we are reproducing in sin. And therefore, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the key to understand, before a habitation can be built, man had first to be saved and restored. How? Ephesians 6.23 gives us the hint. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wages of sin is death. And from the day Adam sinned, Death reigned. There was spiritual death. There was physical death. 
and man lived only a given time on earth today. The earth as we know it, the earth has not yet redeemed. 120 years, Genesis chapter 6, 3 tells us. And yet, Psalm 90, 10 tells us we'll be very blessed if we can just have 70 or even 80 years. Is the word of God not true? That eternal life is much more than a physical life on earth. There's a life in eternity that God has destined for each and every one of us. And it's a free gift to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 8 reminds that we can partake of the free gift. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith and not of yourselves. If you think highly of yourself that you are perhaps one of those that get saved, think again. <clears throat> it is not because of how good of yourself, not how good of your righteousness may be. It is a gift of God, it reminds. <clears throat> Two key phases that we must always remember. It is by grace. It is through faith. Not through any works you can do. Not through how many times you stand at a pulpit to preach. Not about how much things you can do for God. It just requires an act of belief and a decision by choice and a decision to walk in the newness of life. Man was destined to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but yet it could not come without men knowing salvation and restoring that relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 asks a question. And Apostle Paul says, what? Know you not? Means you should know. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Important. And not just a temple. It's in you. Something is in you. Which you have of God. And you are not your own. You no longer belong to yourself. Well, I want to tell you something. The promise of the gift that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 14, in verse 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. I pause a minute. He didn't talk about perfection. He talked about heart of desire to keep. And I will pray the Father and He will give you another comforter. Notice this word, another comforter. In Greek it says, elos parakletos. Another of the same nature, another of the same character, another that's identical to me in every way. How many not know that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. But the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Christ. That's the mystery of the Trinity. Three in one, yet three in distinct personalities. But I'm not going that way now, but enough to know this. He is another comfort that Jesus will give. Notice that. He will give. And that he may abide with you forever. Notice the word. Abide. He didn't say that he will come and visit you. He will abide. Abide carries the word of living, of being with you. Abide with you. What? Forever. Even the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because the world will not see him, neither will he know him. But you 
know Him. If you are a believer today, the Word of God says you know God. Because you know God, you know Jesus whom He has sent. Because you know Jesus whom He sent, you know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And because you know Jesus who, as a living word whom He sent, you will know the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout a la- loud amen to that. You will know the Holy Spirit. Not you can. Not you may. But you know Him. For, and here comes why you know Him. For He dwells. Hear the word dwelling? For He dwells with you and shall be in you. Hallelujah. I hope that begins to open your understanding. When Christ died, when you received Jesus Christ, you are saved. When you are saved, you are not saved to enjoy just the blessings of God. You are saved to be the habitation of the living God. And because you are the habitation of the living God, habitations are meant to be occupied. Habitations are not left, meant to be left empty and vacant. And whether they like it or not, the Holy Spirit is dwelling with you and the Holy Spirit is with you and in you. And you are no longer your own. You have been given free choice. But in this, you have no choice. Somebody say amen. Whether you like it, whether you believe it, whether you want it or not, if you are a true believer of Jesus Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. And the Holy Spirit is here and now. Hallelujah. But the important question we ask ourselves, even as He promised the promise of the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, what did He say? Do not, sorry, not John, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. He says, to continue assembling, <coughs> You're going to be baptized, not just with water as John baptized. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit just doesn't want you to abide with you, in you. The Holy Spirit wants to do something. The word baptism means for you to be immersed. You're baptized in water means you get dunk, you get soaked, you get wet with water. The fact in the Holy Spirit about you getting wet, about immersed, about every part of you being soaked and being one with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, hallelujah. Yes. This is one of the most important things. Jesus wants you to be immersed, not just to have the Holy Spirit, but to be soaked, to be immersed, to be completely having the Holy Spirit with you. Question I ask again, is this for the church or is this for believers? Believers like you and for I. The key, I repeat again, God desires a habitation and not a visitation. Right from the Old Testament, He's been hinting. He's been hinting with promises come with the habitation. Remember Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2? He that dwell, notice the word dwell, in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Then he's able to declare, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress in him will I trust. Then the rest of the promise flow. Surely, surely, he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler. He will protect me from all the contagious pandemics. See why a lot of Christians don't understand this? If you walk in that, there'll be no fear. And this is critical. God desires a habitation, not a visitation. And God will provide the habitation, but cannot have the habitation so long as we are in sin. And remember, the habitation is not the church. 
this habitation is about believers. Somebody say Amen. <clears throat> now, very important. Jesus has to go that you can be the temple. Jesus came back. But Jesus has to go again. And he said this. There's a truth, he said in John 16, 7. I tell you the truth. It's important for me to go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come. Amen. You see all what you're talking earlier about going and going. Going first to prepare mention. Going, then he's going to come back. But we need to understand that if it, the Holy Spirit is the crux of all this thing about inhabitation. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Why was the Holy Spirit given? Why is it important that we need to really be immersed with the Holy Spirit and not just have the temple of the Holy Spirit and not just have the, temp the Holy Spirit in the temple within us? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? The key to understand is the primary work of the Holy Spirit is what? To reveal the glory of God the Father. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is not to bless you, not to make you feel good, not just to empower you, not just to give you authority. The primary work is to reveal the glory of the Father. How does he reveal the glory of God the Father? By revealing the glory of Jesus Christ in the gospel. The Holy Spirit first reveals the good news of Jesus. Somebody shout amen to that. That's why salvation belongs to the Lord. Without the Spirit of God moving in your life, you will never be able to see the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Does that make sense? That's why salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord didn't wait for you. He came for you. If you think you've been seeking God, it took me some time to realize that it was God that had been seeking me all along. Second thing, not only reveal the good news of Jesus Christ, but you know what he was trying to do? He was trying to reveal the manifestation of the glory of God through the work of His Son. And I give you John 16, verses 8 to 11. Jesus has said this, and when He is come, when the Holy Spirit is come, He will do three important things. <clears throat> he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The first thing when the Holy Spirit is come, listen to what Jesus said. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. How does he do that? One, of sin. Because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit is the one that shows sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads you to believe in Jesus Christ. Second, of righteousness. Because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Why did Jesus have to live? He had to leave in order that he can, what? Impute his righteousness on us. That's what the Word of God says. And though our righteousness are but filthy rags before God, we and I have become righteousness as we believe in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ is imputed upon us. Somebody say amen. Not because of anything to do, but what Christ has done. That is what the Holy Spirit does. It brings the imputation of righteousness and it continues to help us day to day, minute by minute, to impart the righteousness of God to us that we can live a life of righteousness. Not by strength, not by might, but by His Holy Spirit, says the Lord. Somebody say amen. And the third thing of judgment. Wow, that's very fearful. Every time we hear the judgment, we think, oh, God is going to judge us. We're going to go to hellfire if we don't repent. 
Our God is a God of love, a God of grace, a God of mercy, but yet a God of righteousness and God that changes not. You see here, Jesus explained of judgment. Of judgment how? Because the prince of the world is judged. Hallelujah. You know, this verse began to open my eyes and perspective of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not here to judge. He's judging the world. He's judging darkness. He's judging Satan. Somebody say amen. But he's come also for another task. He's come to you and I as believers. Why? To lead, to guide, and to empower for what purposes? For believers to become disciples that you and I can finish the work that Jesus started at the cross, that Jesus brought to you through his resurrection, that Jesus gave to us at his ascension. And now in Pentecost, you and I are given the authority and the power to carry on, to bring the work of Jesus beyond what his physical presence on earth brings. As disciples, we begin to continue and complete the work started by Jesus. Right? And today, you and I are to manifest the glory of God. These are the very words in Habakkuk 2. And the knowledge of the glory of God shall soon cover the earth even as the waters cover the sea. Not just the glory of God, not only just the Shekinah glory of God, but the knowledge. And you saw that in the early church, right? The people saw, the people had the knowledge. And people then got touched and believed. Somebody say amen. So this is important. Restoration of mankind has already started. Deuteronomy 28, 14 has already happened. And the Lord says, He shall make you the head and not the tail, and you shall above only, and you shall not be beneath. If you would but listen to the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command you to say, not only to observe, but to do. Deuteronomy 28, 1. Repeat, and it shall come to pass, if you would listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all the commandments which I command this day. The Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is in the house. You are the house. You are a habitation for what? For the manifestation of the knowledge of the glory of God. How does it work? Listen to the formula. Listen and do. How many know you cannot listen if you don't have a relationship? How many know that you not listen clearly if you don't have the right focus? If you are focused on the things of the world, you only hear from the world. Somebody say, Amen. But let's take a lesson, and I'm going to round this up very quickly, from the Old Testament. First Corinthians 10, 11 says, what happened in the Old Testament is still important. Now, all these things happened to them. To them who? To Israel. That they can be, and the old King James used the word, assembled. Assembled is not just example. It's as a typology. It's as something that you can look at, something you can learn from. They are in meant to be instructions upon them whom the ends of the world are coming. How many know that we are not the end time church, but indeed the last days church of Jesus Christ? Somebody shout Amen. Hail. Amen. We who are wise to the signs of time must also know the time of the signs. And I want to tell you now the time of the signs is here and now. But I'm not doing a teaching on the end times, but enough for you to know that what God wants you to do we need two things, hearing. We need two things, understanding. 
We need another thing, obedience to do it. So for the closing lesson, I'll take a quick look at <clears throat> First Kings chapter 17. If you've got your Bible, you can turn quickly with me to First Kings chapter 17 and follow me. I am looking at it from the King James Version. And very quickly, we are going to move very quickly right now. And here in First Kings, we see verse 1. And Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. Ah, very interesting. This is the first mention of Elijah. And uh, Elijah's unknown. All we know, he comes from Tishbite. He didn't have a fish bite or anything, but he's the Tishbite. Um, and what's all that happened on Gilead? And he came to Ahab, who was a king. He came with a word from God. And the word was about a famine that's coming according to the word that he was delivering, the Bible says. Background, ordinary person, background, unknown, asked to bring a word. But the Bible also tells us as the word he brought, which was from God and his help place, famine came upon the land, what happened? Poor Elijah also got affected. He got affected by the famine. Very soon he was like those, not able to get water, not able to get food. And then, I guess what must happen? He started to cry out to the Lord. Because the Lord has been reminding His people through the whole of eternity, cry out to me. Cry out to me. When did the deliverance of Israel happen and the deliverer sent? When God said, I have heard the cries of my people. It took the people of Israel hundreds of years before they realized to cry out. Amen. I hope you don't take that long. But the key was, I believe, as Elijah cried out, you see what begins to happen. As you have, I want you to see this formula. Wherever you cry out to God, God hears and God will give a word. The word will contain instruction. Instructions will bring a promise. But a promise requires your obedience. And in obedience, you'll see fulfillment. So you see what happened here in Scripture. As he cried out, right? And the Lord says what? Get you hands, go, turn eastward, go to a place called Brook Cherith. And there you will find by the brook there's water. And there you shall drink of the brook. And God says, I will do something supernatural. I'll get ravens to bring you what? Meat to feed you. Wow. You see, here comes faith. In the natural, to a typical Israelite, ravers, ravens are unclean animals. And yet God often chooses things of the weak, the things yet of the natural, to do a supernatural in the natural. Just mark those words. A lot of times you're just looking for supernatural divine miracles. But God often uses the things of the natural to do a supernatural. So he got instruction. So what did he do? The Bible says he went up and did according to the word of God. And he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith. And what happened? See, obedience action. Elijah had to respond. Elijah had to do. No matter how ridiculous the word is, ravens bringing food. <laughs> you and I could say, God, you're joking. And the ravens did bring him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. So we see because of his obedience to the things that may seem ridiculous. Because God often uses the things that are foolish to confound the wise. Somebody say amen. And so there he was. And he was enjoying himself while the rest of Israel was in famine in drought, he was drinking of the brook, he was being fed by the ravens. How many know that sometimes God still wants you to shake up and do what he wants you to do? Amen? God did not bless you that you only be blessed. He makes you a blessing that you can be a blessing. Somebody say amen. And then the Bible says, suddenly the brook dried up. Suddenly no more water. So Elijah said, okay, okay, at least I got ravens that bring me flesh and meat. And suddenly ravens stopped coming. 
<laughs> Amen. What to do next? Cry out to the Lord. That's what he was doing. He must say, oh God, what happened now? Hello? God, is there some sin in my life? Is something I've done that stopped all this? No. When God seems to close the door, He will open a bigger and better door if you but trust Him. And so, I believe, here the Bible tells us, Ed, as he was crying out, the Lord now gave him a word. Arise! Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon. And there is a widow woman. Now you must remember, a woman is a weak thing. In those days, a woman was not career woman like nowadays. They could not provide for themselves. Women had to depend on their fathers for provision, or they get married than on the husband's provision, right? But here, not only a woman, but a widow. A woman that has lost even the provision of her husband. Wow. And he says, go there. I have prepared a widow woman to sustain you. <laughs> See how funny it is. God, you think such a weak thing, not only a woman, but a widow. Poor widow, if you like. <laughs> but so, here, God gave the word. Did it consider, contain instruction? Yes. Did it contain the promise? Yes. Did Elijah have to believe? Yes. Did Elijah have to obey? Yes. So the Bible says, Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. Now, here comes another lesson to learn. And when he went to the gate of the city, Behold, the woman was there gathering sticks. Now, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, go and bring me some water. Now, I want you to listen to this part. And as the woman is going to fetch the water for him, obviously, there's still some water in that place. And then he said to her, Bring me, I pray you, a morsel of bread. Bring me some food, in other words. And all of a sudden, the widow stopped. You see, the woman did not object to asking for water. She must have been prepared by God to expect a prophet to come. Obviously, she would see Elijah the prophet because prophets those days are totally different, wear animal skins or what have you not. So she obeyed getting water. But when it comes to getting food, look at her objection. She paused, she stopped. <sighs> you know what she said next? As the Lord your God, listen, not the Lord my God live. As the Lord your God live, your God live. You must know that I have no more food. All I had was a little bit of flour. All I have is one little small cup of oil. I was gathering this stick to light the fire. I was going to cook this final flour. I'm going to use the oil. Then my son and myself are going to eat it. And then I'm going to lie down and die. You see, how often have you found men and women of God who can believe in God, but yet have come to a point of desperation that they are prepared to give up? And here is that widow woman. Hope was revived when the prophet came. But hope died when the prophet wanted to eat of her last leftover. <laughs> how many know that sometimes our promises can be lost? or stolen, or destroyed, sometimes not even by ourselves, but by circumstance, situation, and by people around us. Time doesn't allow me to elaborate too much, but enough to remember our promises from God can be lost, can be stolen, can be destroyed. Sometimes not by sin in our life, sometimes by people around us. What do you do in response? What do you do in response? Learn the word from Scripture. So what did Elijah say? He rebuked fear. What are the words he said? Fear not. Fear not. I must tell you that at times I've had the word of God and as I want to do the word of God, 
Different things happen that make me also worry, anxiety, fear. Fear can come from not myself, but people around us by circumstance or situation. And the first good thing to do is stop negative confession. Stop negative confession. Stop saying, why cannot? Say, fear not. And then repeat the word of God. And then challenge people to do the word of God. Amen? She said, fear not. What is it? Go and do. Listen, what's important? Go, do. And guess what happened? Women have fear rebuked. And she did go and she did do. And listen to the fulfillment of promise. As she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and conjunctive, she and he and house did eat many days because the barrel of the flour did not run out. Neither did a little bit of oil. And everything went according to the word of God. Somebody say, Amen. We hear. We understand. But do we trust? Do we believe? And would we do? Truly obedience is better than sacrifice. There are many things that the Lord has asked us to do. One of the things, for example, in this pandemic was to continue on-site services. <laughs> it's scary. Now with news that it may be airborne as well. So what do you do? I had to rebuke fear. We take precautions. That's why we have sanitizers and all those around, filters and all those. But we still trust. And the key was three things we started to do. We start to praise God, we start to pray, and we prophesy the word of faith into situations. I must now conclude. I've run over my time. Proverbs 20, 27 reminds us that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And where is the spirit of man? It's in you. The Holy Spirit wants to light the candle in you. The Holy Spirit wants to be here and now within you to light the candle within you. But the question I ask now, have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Notice I didn't ask, do you have the Holy Spirit? Each and every one of you there's a true believer of Jesus Christ already have the Holy Spirit. But I asked, have you received the Holy Spirit? Let me tell the difference. The Holy Spirit can be in a house and yet you may not have received it. Let me use an example. I was just using this illustration yesterday. <clears throat> Let's say my wife and self invite Jeremy and his wife Elaine to come to our house for dinner. Still can, huh? Invite two. <laughs> and so, as they were just coming, he's coming from work, from the school, and she's coming from the house. She leaves a bit earlier, and she arrives at her home earlier. And our helper, Jema, you know, allows her into the house. But it so happened that my wife and self, not ready, we were still obsessed, changing and everything. Right? But is Elaine in the house? Yes. She's let in and she's sitting in the living room waiting. And all of a sudden, Jeremy calls. And I pick up the phone and he asks, Pastor, is my wife there yet? How will I answer? I'll say, yeah, yeah, she's in the house. But we have not received her yet. <laughs> See a difference? The Holy Spirit can be in the house. But many of us may not have received him. We have not understood the importance. The Holy Spirit wants to light the candle. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. The Holy Spirit wants to bring you to become a man or woman of faith. But if you have not received Him, you are not hearing. You are not doing. So today, the first question, have you received the Holy Spirit? 
Remember, it's only when you receive the Holy Spirit that there can be dialogue, that relationship that can then be allowed to grow. Then, understand something. The Holy Spirit can then have you. When the Holy Spirit has you, it's like a baptism of Spirit. You get immersed with the Holy Spirit. Today, I ask this question for those on site here and online here. If not yet received the Holy Spirit, I want to say a simple prayer and I'll lead you in that prayer. And I want you, wherever you are, stand up in the presence of God. This is a simple question. It requires a simple act of faith. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Even if you're not sure, you can just stand up right now. And you can pray this prayer after me. Pray, saying, Almighty God, I acknowledge you as one and only God. I acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And I receive the gift of eternal life by faith. Holy Spirit, I know my body is now the temple of Holy Spirit. I know you are in the house. But Holy Spirit, I want to receive you right now. In faith, I ask you to fill me. Fill this temple until I overflow with you. Fill me until every part of my body is immersed in you. Holy Spirit, have full reign over my life. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Simple prayer that you can pray again and again on your own. Simple prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to come. He's already in you, but to come upon you. To come to take over your life. To come to keep you focused upon Jesus as the author and finisher of faith. To come that you can live the life that will be word-based the life that's spirit-led and the life of faith. The Holy Spirit will help you. But remember, it's you who make the choices. It's you who make the decisions. The Holy Spirit that will lead, to guide, to empower, to strengthen, to comfort. But you still have to make the choices. The second question I have to ask Although the Holy Spirit did not come to empower and inhabit the church of Jesus Christ as a body, He did. But as a building, as a church, as an institution, as a local church of gathering, I want to say this to you. The word of Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us to consider one another, to provoke, to love, and good works. And to Yes, the Bible says, and not of force, uh, forsaking the assembling together in the right manner to encourage one another, another. Even as see the problems and the circumstances and situations. I didn't say, are you attending a church? I said, do you belong to a community of believers? I want to challenge you. I'm not saying, are you attending a church? Are you belonging? If you have not, do begin to set your heart to find a community that God wants to lead you into. Three things are always important. Community has to be word-based, spirit-led, and faith-filled. Who can lead you? God can lead you. Ask God. God may ask you to visit different churches just to get an idea Yes, there's a good challenge to be on site as ITE, to have insight of what's happening. And that's my challenge to each and every one of you, whether you're online or whether you are on site here. 
The Word of God is not about just attending a church, not just watching an online service, but do you belong to a community of believers? Because there is a collective anointing. And the Word of God, I don't have time to expand on this, is that one of us can put a thousand to flight. But two of us put not two thousand, but ten thousand to flight. Amen. So I want to challenge you. Besides working on receiving the Holy Spirit, I pray that you begin to look for a right community to belong to and so that you can work out what God wants you to do. Amen. So Father, I thank you, Lord. I have brought your word, I brought your message. But I thank you, God, that Lord, Holy Spirit, you're the one that's going to bring understanding, revelation. You are the one that's going to bring conviction. You're going to one that bring newness of life. You're the one that's going to bring that resurrection in the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that they can truly live to glorify and magnify the Father Almighty. And we give thanks and say, bless each and every one of you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you all.